Welcome to the Football Threat Mock Draft 1.0, the only mock draft where Roger Goodell gets booed. Let's get right into it. Number one. Right off the bat, we got a trade, and it's the Colts, no surprise, but the quarterback, you might not have been expecting him. Stroud's been getting slept on this entire draft process, but he might be the right guy at the right time. Sure, Steichen does have a history of developing some elite athletes, but GM Chris Ballard might not have the leash to survive a project quarterback. I think Stroud's accuracy and mobility give him the high floor and decent ceiling that could save Chris Ballard's job. As far as the trade goes, I don't think it should take that much. Probably something similar to what we saw with the Jets a few years back when they traded with the Colts, actually. I feel like two second rounders gets it done. Number two, I really wanted to mock Anthony Richardson here. For one, D'Amico Ryans has a six year contract, so he's definitely safe and can take on a project. And the first commenter on my Anthony Richardson video really wants him. But considering that Ryans just hired an offensive coordinator from the Shanahan tree, my gut feeling tells me that Ryans takes the quarterback who ran a similar system in college. And Levis does have talent. And sure, he's an older prospect, but he didn't really actually get to play quarterback that much in his early years. So there's something to dream on. That's my pick for now, but maybe next mock draft? Who knows? His old boss, Kyle Shanahan, did take the very raw Trey Lance. Number three. I'm not overthinking this one, and neither will the Cardinals. Sure, they can go trade here, because there will be some QB needy teams, but... But their new coach, Jonathan Gannon? He's going to want to replicate that front he had with the Eagles. And what better way to do that than with Jalen Carter, who's getting non-stop comparisons to Fletcher Cox. The truth is, there aren't that many pass-rushing defensive tackles out there, so passing up a trade to get Carter makes sense. Number 4. This one might break the record for fastest draft card turned in. You can definitely see it now. The Bears run into the podium to select Will Anderson, as ESPN begs to let them get a commercial in before the pick. Will Anderson Jr. has been getting a lot of comparisons to Von Miller, but I don't quite see that. He's not twitchy the same way Miller is, but I also don't think that's a bad thing. I think some going to the film expecting elite, elite bend are disappointed, but that's because I think he compares better to DeMarcus Ware. He wasn't the twitchiest guy either, and I think the people disappointed by Anderson's film see his strong use of leverage and think he's not flashing elite skills. He is, and they're going to show up in the NFL. Also, I haven't really mentioned why the Bears make this pick, but this is as obvious as it gets for them. I was dead set on not having a trade in the first pick in this mock draft. My thinking was it just didn't make sense. The numbers didn't add up. After all, there's four good quarterbacks who are pretty much at a similar level, and there are two teams at 1-3 and three who don't need quarterbacks. Why would anyone make a trade? The numbers just don't add up. But then again, billionaires are not as good at math as you think. Number 5. I can't see Carroll turning down the athletic profile that Richardson presents. And as far as leashes go, Pete Carroll has as long as one in the NFL. The ownership definitely trusts him, considering they gave up Russell Wilson last year. And yeah, Carroll is getting on in the years, but he also will outlive us all. He's still got the energy to take on a project like Richardson. Number 6. And we've got another trade. With the Lions deciding to stick with Goff and build up their draft capital. It's an interesting bet considering where the roster is and how soft the NFC looks. Not to mention, none of the four quarterbacks are guaranteed to be as good as Jared Goff. So why not push all the chips in and try to win now? They definitely got the roster for it. For the Panthers, the trade makes sense too. Sure, they might have to give up a first round pick next year, like the Bears did for Justin Fields. Regardless, it's better than having to pay $50 million a year for the honor of having a narrative that Reich doesn't like shorter quarterbacks. I might have been one of them too. But honestly, there aren't that many short quarterbacks. I think Reich will definitely be tantalized by what he can do with a guy like Young. His arm talent mixed with that system, as well as their good offensive line, that's a recipe for success. Number 7. With the best QBs gone and failing to make a trade up, the Raiders regret alienating Derek Carr and reach for a left tackle. Though luckily, Paris Johnson is a very solid left tackle prospect and is looking likely to get selected ahead of Skaronski. He doesn't have a long college track record of success, but he does have the physical traits to make it in the NFL. If the Raiders do end up getting Jimmy G because of the familiarity, they'll need a good offensive line to keep him healthy, something he hasn't ever done in his career. If that's the case, hopefully Paris Johnson can develop a little faster than someone like Andrew Thomas in New York. Number 8. Falcons get themselves a pass rusher. Makes sense because they probably are going to give it a go with Desmond Ritter. After all, they did use a second round pick for him, which is not nothing. I'm not the biggest Desmond Ritter guy, but he's athletic and that offensive system produces a lot of easy throws. Also, the Falcons have a lot of needs and the defensive line is definitely one of them. Tyree Wilson's a little raw, but he's got the length and the tools that you want. He might take a bit, but he's very likely to wreak havoc at the next level. So the Lions get corner Devin Witherspoon thanks to a trade down. All you need to see is that first hit from Witherspoon to know that 
obviously Dan Campbell will be pulled to him. Gravity be like that. Witherspoon is most likely the most fun guy to watch in this draft, as long as you forget about CTE for the moment. It's hard to remember sometimes that he's actually a corner, and he can cover too. He managed to snag five interceptions in his career at Indiana, and that's in a pretty run-heavy conference. Time will tell if Witherspoon can adjust to playing more zone in the NFL, but if he does, he's a star. In worst case scenario, he could be a hell of a safety. Number 10. The Eagles take a long, rangy corner, Chris Gonzalez, since James Bradbury is likely to leave in free agency. If I'm being honest, I really wanted to take B. Jen Robinson here. Sure, Sanders is gone, but they probably want to give Kenneth Gainwell some run. Also with Hurts, I just don't think a running back is something they really would use. And it's not like Gonzalez isn't an intriguing prospect. Corners like him who are 6'2 and can move really well, they are hard to come by. Not to mention, he fits amazingly schematically. He's got the short area quickness they covet. But ugh, imagine Bijan running behind that offensive line. Number 11. This is Mike Vrabel's first draft after winning the power struggle with John Robinson and you imagine he probably is going to have a lot of input. I'm guessing it's Skoronsky. You can see Vrabel pushing the right buttons for a guy who's been catching a lot of strays this draft season. He's at worst a very good guard, as you can see with his movement skills. He's definitely going to open up some big runs. And if you can hack it at left tackle despite his short arms, it wouldn't be the first time that would happen for a Northwestern tackle. Scouts thought Rashawn Slater wasn't going to make it, and then, you know, he's an all-pro now. The Texans take Quentin Johnson with their second first round pick. It would be a smart move after taking Levis with their first pick. Nico Collins looks decent, but he could use a running partner. And they're not going to bring back Brandon Cooks after he quite quit last season. Quentin Johnson is very much your classic wide receiver first round pick. Of course, you'd like production, but if it's not there, you're willing to bet on the intense physical skill set. He's fast and lengthy, but most impressively is just how good he is at the yak part of the game. Usually players with his body type aren't really yak guys, they're more outside receivers. And that's going to drive well with the system they're installing in Houston. 12 might seem high to some, but that's just because all those draft nicks who have him fall into the second round are as high as number 13. It's unclear if the Jets will keep this pick because obviously all that Aaron Rodgers talk will likely result in a trade that involves a first round pick. For now, I assume they miss out on the sweepstakes and go for someone like Garoppolo. The Jets obviously need to tackle and they could do a lot worse than Broderick Jones. And I mean a lot worse. He's a really fun watch. He can hold up in coverage, get out in space, sometimes block two guys at a time. As far as I'm concerned, Stetson Bennett definitely, definitely needs to thank him in his future Hall of Fame speech. The only knock on him is that he's raw, I guess, but he did have a bunch of starts over the course of two seasons, which were both national championship seasons, so he's probably pretty good. And he kept Jamari Salyer from being the starting left tackle, and we saw how well he transitioned to the NFL. Number 14. We got another trade. Armed with some extra draft picks, the Lions decided to trade up this time. The Lions could have went with an edge player here, but with a stellar play from Houston and Hutchinson, it makes sense for them to go for the defensive interior, which is why I have them taking Kalaja Kansi. He's a small but powerful defensive tackle from Pittsburgh, meaning he's going to get compared to Aaron Donald, but those comparisons are quite sweaty. But they're not completely insane. He is a similar kind of player in the sense that he converts a lot of speed into power. And beyond that, the Lions general manager, Brad Holmes, was there when they drafted Donald. Number 15. The Packers, yet again, do not take a receiver in the first round. However, they do take an offensive playmaker. Growth. But seriously, whether or not Rodgers actually stays, they could use a tight end. Also, taking a receiver this high doesn't make sense. The two guys they drafted last year showed a lot of promise. Why add another younger guy into that room? Also, I think Michael Mayer would actually fit really well there because he can also block. He's another guy that's been falling lately, but that's just another sign of that draft season's officially here. By that, I mean people are officially running out of takes, so they start spewing out stuff that makes guys like Michael Mayer go from surefire top 10 picks to maybe second rounders. Don't be fooled, he's exactly the kind of tight end that actually gets on the field. Number 16. The Washington Commanders take Brian Breezy, a defensive tackle, after Deron Payne decides to leave him free agency. This isn't that much of an area of need for the Commanders, however, Rivera does like to keep his defensive line fresh, he likes to have a big rotation, this has been the case since even in his Panther days. So adding a guy like Breezy and his athletic profile, he's another Bruce Feldman freakless guy, makes sense. Breezy is another pass rushing defensive tackle, 
Well, sort of. He didn't play much three technique in college, but he projects well for that role in the NFL. And like I said, he's a freak physically, and at over 300 pounds, he's projected to run 4640. So it doesn't take much of a leap to think, okay, he can convert speed to power in the NFL. He also looks like he might have the intangibles. He dealt with a lot during his college career, like an ACL injury, as well as the passing away of his sister to cancer. This is definitely one of those moments where I'm glad I haven't done a face reveal yet. Number 17. The Steelers need tackles and guards, but I have them taking a receiver. It might not seem like the most prudent decision, but the premier tackles are gone and none of the guards are really worth it at this point. One of the strengths of their team already is receiver, but why not take another one here? Especially since it's Jordan Addison. Jordan Addison won the Blitnikoff back in 2021 when Kenny Pickett was still his quarterback, so the chemistry is there. Maybe it's not quite Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase level, but it could be pretty dynamic at the next level. For some reason, Addison is a guy who's dropping a lot in drafts right now because his size is apparently an issue because, I don't know, even though the NFL seems to be trending in the direction of small receivers and he has high-end production in an elite conference like the ACC and he did very well in the Pac-12 as well. I think he just needs a good combine in the way that Chris Olave did to cement himself as a legit mid first round pick. Number 18. I got another trade here and it's the Patriots doing what they do best trading down. This works out well for the Vikings who desperately need to make improvements on the defensive side of the ball and Joey Porter would be a great fit. Their new defensive coordinator, Brian Flores, will definitely know what to do with his long limbs and press coverage. I'm not going to pretend to know what an elite arm length is, but apparently that's what Joey Porter has. And it also definitely shows up on tape. He gets his hands on a disproportionate amount of footballs. Problem is, they end up in the dirt. Overall, though, I'm very excited about Joey Porter Jr. Because, I mean, there's something really fun about the idea of watching someone with Joey Porter's jeans play cornerback in the NFL. Number 19. Here I have finally someone taking the best player in the draft, or at least arguably one of the best players in the draft, and at the very very least the safest player in this draft. And that's B. Jen Robinson, and he's going to the Bucks. This might not seem like a great fit because they don't have a quarterback and you know why invest in a running back, but this saves them from overreacting and taking someone too high here. Also, they're installing the Shanahan offense. Why not see what B. Jen can do in that system, and then maybe add Hendon Hooker in the second round. Could work pretty well actually, especially in the weak NFC South. And at the very least, if this happens, I'm probably drafting BJ Robinson first overall in my fantasy draft. Number 20. Seahawks are back with another pick in the first round. This time it's their own. After taking Anthony Richardson to stash him on the bench and let him develop, they're still in dire need of dogs. Lucky for them, there's a bunch of really good edge rushers still available like Miles Murphy, Nolan Smith, and maybe Lucas Van Ness counts as one. But I think they go for broke here. And I think Andre Carter is the go for broke guy of this year's draft class. Carter is super raw and not in the way that one year starters at Alabama get described as that or even raw in the way where some guy played basketball and he's converting to tight end. I mean raw as in like raw materials. Drafting him is like going to Home Depot and getting the materials you need to build a gazebo. He almost needs to get built from the ground up physically. Army has different weight requirements so they don't let players get big in the same way college programs do. I bet Pete Carroll has some amazing smoothie recipe and we'll use that to make him into the next Alden Smith without the baggage. Number 21. Most of Chargers Twitter is dead set on a receiver, but there is a smaller faction who's really into the idea of adding to the edge group. I don't think that's a good idea. Yes, pass rushers are very difficult to find outside of the second round and mostly really the first round. But receivers, the recent trend has shown that you definitely have to start drafting them higher and higher than ever before. Last year, all the good speed guys were gone by the middle of the second round. Also, it's a lot easier to find a decent stopgap free agent when it comes to the D-line as opposed to the receiver position. Beyond that, I just, I don't think it's a good idea to keep investing in defense with what we saw with the Eagles and the Chiefs. They had the pass rush and so what? If the Chargers are going to compete with the Chiefs, they need to put up points. And they're not going to be able to do that unless they really add some speed. I was definitely tempted to add Jalen Hyde here, but if I'm looking for trends when it comes to GMs, I think Telesco we'll go for the crafty speed guy coming out of Boston College, Zay Flowers, after he drafted a guy from the same spot, Zion Johnson, last year in the first round. Flowers is small, but he definitely reminds you of Antonio Brown, but in a good way, especially with how naturally he catches go balls with his inside shoulder. Also, I think if Telesco doesn't draft a sub 4-4 guy this year, he has to get 51 50 Number 22. I've got the Ravens taking a pass rusher. Sure, they need like two, three receivers, but... Nolan Smith just really seems like a Ravens kind of guy. Drafting guy who would have went a lot higher if it wasn't for an injury. Beyond that, I think they could probably address receiver and free agency or via trade. They probably need a veteran to keep Lamar happy because he's really in his window right now. 
And I think Smith would work well in their defense. He plays with his hair on fire and projects to be a solid pass rusher and will be very stout in the run. Number 23. The Patriots finally stopped trading, but only because no one wants to trade with them anymore. Truth is, the guy they end up taking, Matthew Bergeron, they probably could have had maybe even in the third round. But as we know, Bill Belichick does not care. And for good reason. When you're a real football team with real needs, and that means specific measurements and that kind of thing that you need for those players to have. But yeah, I definitely think that Bergeron is the most Belichick-y type pick this year. From what I saw from some game tape where he played Clemson, it didn't look great. But he did look a lot better at the Senior Bowl. And I mean, to be fair, he was playing with Syracuse against Clemson, so what do you want from him? Number 24, Jaguars take Brian Brandt. He's not a punt returner like this clip by PFF had him at 9, but these do-it-all types tend to fall quite often in drafts. Not every defense has a spot for them. Luckily for Branch, he ends up on a team that is ascending, and they will know what to do with him. The Giants take Jackson Smith and Jigba. He's about as solid of a receiver as it comes, and looks ready for the pro game. So after the Giants sign Daniel Jones to a $50 million deal, they'll be able to settle once and for all if Daniel Jones has got it or not. If he can't make the necessary throws with JSN in his offense and with Dable coaching him, yeah, I don't know if you want to keep him around as an option quarterback. With Dalton Schultz leaving a free agency, the Cowboys could use a tight end, and I think Dalton Kincaid sounds like a pretty good fit, but only because he's a tight end and they need one. Mike McCarthy has never really developed a tight end of this kind. By that I mean the athletic specimen type. Also, all this chatter about Kincaid replacing Michael Mayer as tight end one of the draft kind of ignores a really simple fact. Tight ends who can't block particularly great don't see the field much. Most coaches simply don't use their tight end as a receiver, or at least very often. So for Kincaid to reach his potential, it really depends on where he goes. I think if he went to the Chiefs as a developmental tight end for when Travis Kelsey eventually slows down, eventually, that would have been pretty great, but I don't see him necessarily working out everywhere he goes. Number 27. I know that they need a running back, but Bijou's gone and Jameer Gibbs kind of seems like a pretty similar type back to what they already have with James Cook. And my thinking here with Jalen Hyde is, why not add a sub 4-3 guy? I mean, if Allen is going to insist on overthrowing his receivers, why not get him a guy who he'd have real trouble doing that with? This seems like a no-brainer to me, and I know they have some receivers and could use some other needs, but why not build on strength? And if you're still not convinced, just watch what Allen does, and then watch what Hyatt does, and I'm sure you'll make the connection of why this would be a good idea. I hope. Number 28. I'll admit straight up that I stole this pick from Football Analysis. I was watching his mock draft and I couldn't help but think, man, that's a good pick. Darnell Washington to the Bengals. With Washington, the Bengals would be adding another weapon, but also someone who helps block and might be almost as good as your offensive line at blocking. Adding a guy like that to the mix could really help Joe Burrow go back to doing more goal balls again. It was obviously really smart of him to adjust the way he did this season, but you know he's at his best when he's chucking it, and Washington could definitely give him more time. I think he does compare favorably with Kawhi Leonard, and I don't- and yeah, it's kind of a joke, but it's also not. Kawhi Leonard entered the league as a defensive specialist, and under Greg Popovich he was able to refine its offensive game. If Washington finds himself in the same situation, I could see him turning into a superstar. Though, he's most likely probably going to settle in into a decent career where he's going to be on the field a lot because he's very useful as a blocker. Number 29. I have the Saints taking Miles Murphy. It's a huge fall for the defensive end. It's no knock on him really, there's just a lot of defensive ends this year, even ones who are on the Bruce Feldman freak list like he is. And his tape is pretty good too, he looks like a guy who definitely tries really hard, maybe not that refined, but the effort level's there. Lucky for him he ends up in a pretty good situation. The Saints are probably going to lose Marcus Davenport to free agency, and can use another pass rusher, and they've had a strong development track record with that position. Number 30. Stop me if you've heard this one. The Eagles acquire pass rusher. Sure, it might not seem like a big need for them, but then again, they're probably going to lose some of those guys at free agency. And they've got this sort of roster where they can take time to try to hone the skills that, that Luke Van Ness has. Though I gotta say, and you know, I'm generally a pretty positive guy when it comes to talking about prospects, he might be my least favorite in this mock draft. Like, I get it, he's got the neck for it, and I think that's honestly a big part of the reason why a lot of these draft guys are salivating over him. But you gotta be kinda concerned with the fact that he never really started at Iowa. Cause he's clearly physically gifted. And yeah, he was pretty productive when he was on the field, but that production didn't really tell you whether or not, if it comes down to it, 
could he get a sack without being schemed to do so? Number 31. With the last pick of the first round, the Kansas City Chiefs make a pick for the future. Tight end, Luke Musgrave. Obviously, the Chiefs are pretty set at tight end, but at some point, Travis Kelsey probably has to slow down, you'd think. Just, I can't believe how healthy he's been over the last how many years as a tight end where he's getting slammed to the ground as often as he is. But even if he still has something in the tank, the Chiefs could take Musgrave and really let him figure it out. After all, Kelsey took a while to develop too, and Musgrave is probably going to need it. Luckily though, the Chiefs are probably the best team for him to do that. He doesn't project to be your classic tight end, but he definitely projects to be an extremely athletically gifted one. At 6'6", he was an elite long jumper in high school, and apparently is also an elite skier. That's pretty cool. But the point I'm making is he clearly is a gifted athlete, and he might even have more upside than Dalton Kincaid in that department. I did consider giving them Nathaniel Dell here because I think he's a really intriguing prospect and I feel like Patrick Mahomes would really like the way he releases off the line. But I also feel that the Chiefs tend to make a lot of forward-thinking moves. Okay, we did it. We got to the end. 31 picks. Luckily, it's only 31 this year. But yeah, definitely let me know. What did you think of the picks? Were there any uh, really, really bad ones? Good ones? Did your team get the QB you wanted? Leave a comment below and let me know. As you could probably tell, or at least hopefully, I put a lot of effort into this one. I figured it'd be really cool to have a mock draft where you get to actually see the players and get a feel for them. I think it was like particularly helpful with the offensive linemen. So if you liked what I did and you find it helpful, please subscribe. Maybe even hit that notification bell. That would be really awesome. I'd really appreciate it. I should probably go because uh, I really need a nap. And I apologize if you heard my cat in the background at any point. She was very upset with me. She clearly has no concept of what a mock draft is and could not give a shit either. <laughs>